This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. Please visit shalcedon.edu to download this book in PDF. The One and the Many by R.J. Rushjini. Copyright 1971-2007, Mark R. Rushjini. Shalcedon Ross House Books. Chapter 10. The Reformation, the Problem Redefined. Section 1. Luther. With the Reformation, the problem of the one and the many was shifted from the arena of philosophy to the arena of theology. Moreover, the locale of the determinative power was shifted from time to eternity. This, the shift came dramatically, and the dissatisfaction with the reigning answer came in Luther's reaction to Tetzel's preaching. The Dominican Tetzel was the vendor of the indulgences proclaimed by the Pope. People were urged to buy indulgences to save their suffering parents and loved ones from the pains and torment of purgatory. Tetzel declares, declared, Remember that you are able to release them, for, quote, As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. End quote. There are those who hold to the theory that Luther's opposition to the indulgences was not at first a radical theological break with Rome, but that rather, as the debate was carried on, Luther was led step by step to the point of departure. Such a position is defective in that it disregards the radical break implicit in the very nature of Luther's opposition to indulgences. Warfield's analysis of the significance of the 95 Theses of Luther pointed out that, quote, it was one of the attractions of the indulgences which Tetzel hawked about that they gave the purchaser the right to choose a confessor for himself and required this confessor to absolve him. They thus made his immunity from all punishment sure. Marvellous to say, the vendors of indulgences were not satisfied with thus selling the justice of heaven. They wished to sell the justice of the earth too. Luther, it is true, in a passage in his resolutions, denies that the Pope, remits civil or rather criminal penalties inflicted by law, but he adds that the legates do this in some places when they are personally present. And in another place he betrays why he wishes to shield the Pope from the onus of this iniquity, saying that the Pope cannot be supposed to have the power to remit civil penalties because in that case the letters of indulgence will abolish all gibbets and racks throughout the world. That is to say, would do away altogether with the punishment of crime. In point of fact, the actual, as distinguished from Luther's ideal, Pope, did issue indulgences embodying this precise provision, and those sold by Tetzel were among them. Henry Charles Lee remarks upon them thus, The power to protect from all, sorts, from all secular courts was delegated to the peripatetic vendors of indulgences who thus carried impunity for crime to every man's door. The St. Peter's indulgences, sold by Tetzel and his colleagues, were of this character, and not only released the purchasers from all spiritual penalties, but forbade all secular or criminal prosecution. It was fortunate that the Reformation came to prevent the Holy See from rendering all justice, human and divine, a commodity to be sold in open market. End quote. In this important analysis, Warfield presented dramatically and clearly the inescapable conclusion of the scholastic philosophy. The determination of history had been shifted from eternity to time, from God to man, so that the world of eternity was subject to the control of man. The fact of this controlling power was not and is not denied by Roman Catholic apologists. The form of the sale of this power is, in their perspective, the error. Tetzel's sales thus brought to focus the philosophical implications of scholastic philosophy. What Aquinas taught in the classroom was now put on the level of the simplest peasant. Man could control God, and time could govern or overrule eternity. Tetzel may have been personally distasteful to his more philosophical Dominican brethren, but his philosophy was simply the concrete application of what the order and the church taught. Luther's opposition was theological. If Luther had not opposed the Pope and indulgences, there would have been, and already was arising, civil opposition. The state was claiming the right to govern time and eternity, and its quarrel with Rome was basically a family quarrel. 
The Reformation did not bring the monarchs and national states into a new power. On the contrary, it sought, as against papacy, empire and crown, to restore sovereignty to God, to place crown and mitre under God. Modern Lutheranism, deeply imbued with heresies, often derives civil authority from below, from natural law. But Hull rightly noted, quote, Because Luther derives the state not from below, but exclusively from above, from God's plan of salvation, he insists on its distinct character as a state whose essence is authority. End quote. Whether or not Luther knew how far his 95 Theses would carry him is beside the point. His opponents recognised their radical nature. The entire authority of Rome had been challenged. The whole world order of scholasticism was denied by Luther. By denying that the power of the church extends beyond the grave, thesis 13, death puts an end to all claims of the church, and by denying that the church and pope have anything but ministerial authority and no power to do more than declare what God's words, God's word allows, theses 6, 27, 28, etc., Luther was clearly challenging every aspect of scholasticism and of the existing church. Luther's intellectual pilgrimage began with his inability, inability religiously to find grace and forgiveness in the temporal church. Salvation, spiritual health, meant, he knew, a good conscience before God. But how could fallen man have a good conscience before God? The remedies the church provided he found futile. Sinful man was offering sinful substitutes for what God alone could give. If the law came from man, then man could forgive offences against the law. But because God gave the law, God alone could forgive the sin against the law. For Luther, neither God nor the law could be set aside. As he wrote later in his small catechism, in question 90, quote, The law has a threefold purpose. First, the law checks to some, to some extent the coarse outbursts of sin and thereby helps to keep order in the world, a curb. Secondly, the law shows us our sins, a mirror. Thirdly, the law teaches us Christians which works we must do to lead a God-pleasing life, a rule. End quote. Luther's conscience vindicated God's law at as against the law of the church. Accordingly, he sought a theology to vindicate God and his law. This he found in Paul's epistle to the Romans. It is commonplace to speak of the subject of Luther's Romans as justification by faith alone. In this there can be no quarrel, provided that it is also made clear that for Luther this meant establishing God's law. It was precisely because the law that man sins against was, for Luther, God's law, that God's salvation is alone efficacious. Thus, commenting on St. Paul's statement, do we then make void the law through faith, God forbid, yea, we establish the law, Luther said, quote, we establish the law, from 331. The law is made void if its validity and authority are denied, so that it is no longer obligatory and men may transgress it. The carnally minded might have accused the apostle of making void the law, since he said that sinners are not justified by the law, but that the righteousness of God is manifested and imparted without the law. On the other hand, the law is established and confirmed when its demands or injunctions are heeded. In this sense, the apostle says, we establish the law. That is, we say that it is obeyed and fulfilled through faith. But you who teach that the works of the law justify without faith, Make the law void, for you do not obey it. Indeed, you teach that its fulfilment is not necessary. The law is established in us when we fulfill it, willingly and truly. But this no one can do without faith. They destroy God's covenant of the law, who are without the divine grace that is granted to those who believe in Christ. End quote. <clears throat> there were times when Luther reflected the older blurring of law and love, and he replaced law with love. Calvin also, at times, underrated the law, calling it coarse rudiments. Calvin also expressed a preference for the common law of nations as against the polity of Moses. Despite these wretched statements and tendencies, 
Both Luther and Calvin undergirded the sovereignty of God's law as against the laws of men and nations, both by their emphasis on justification by God and also by their emphasis on God as creator. In Calvinist circles, the Puritans in particular gave prominence to God's law. Luther struck out sharply against Aristotle's do doctrine of origins and against the influence of Greek thought on Christian thinkers. He strongly defended the doctrine of creation. The doctrine of creation, faithfully held, leads directly to the doctrines of predestination and also to justification by God alone. If the triune God if the triune God is indeed the creator of all things by his sovereign decree, then all things are ordained by God, and salvation is entirely and salvation is entirely the work of God, because man is entirely the creature of God. Man's liberty, the liberty of the Christian man, is, therefore, in God's law and his grace, in submission to God's decree. By virtue of the sovereignty of God, man is freed from slavery to man. By virtue of the law word of God, man serves men in obedience to the word that requires him to obey God by means of his duties to neighbours and masters. This is the ground of Luther's two propositions concerning the liberty and the bondage of the spirit. Quote, a Christian man is perfectly free, Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian man is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. End quote. Because God is sovereign, reason was denied its scholastic autonomy by Luther and placed in submission to God. Reason was, for Luther as for Calvin, important as reason. It was reason as a God sitting in judgment over God that was denied. Quote, Dr. Henning asked, Is reason to hold no authority at all with Christians, since it is to be set aside in matters of faith? The doctor replied, Before faith and the knowledge of God, reason is mere darkness. But in the hands of those who believe, it is an excellent instrument. All faculties and gifts are pernicious, exercised by the impious, but most salutary when possessed by godly persons. End quote. Luther was replacing the pseudo-god of Aristotle and the autonomous man and reason of Greek philosophy with the living god of scripture. The absolute priority of God was both a theological foundation for Luther and a personal experience. Very early in his struggle with Rome, Luther observed... God alone is in this business. We are seized so that I see we are acted upon rather than act. Luther's activism was derived from this faith. Man, being an instrument of God, could not choose to be a spectator. <coughs> Section 2. Against Erasmus. It was in his debate with Erasmus that Luther's thinking came to its sharpest focus. Erasmus in his diatribe or sermon concerning will, approached the subject moralistically, pragmatically, and anthropologically. The approach of Erasmus was also Pelagian. It was not exegetical. Erasmus was not concerned with accepting what scripture taught and faithfully interpreting it. His concern was to save the freedom of the will. As against Luther, he declared, quote, Is it, it is not all true that those who trust in their own works are driven by the spirit of Satan and delivered to damnation. End quote. Erasmus held that, quote, there are several places in scripture which obviously ascribe contingency to God, yes, even a certain mutability. End quote. Moreover, in his preface, Erasmus, the ostensible champion of free will and reason, attacked propositional truth. He spoke of his great dislike of assertions, which he declared to be so great, quote, that I prefer the views of the sceptics wherever the inviolable authority of scripture and the decisions of the church permit, end quote. Erasmus felt that, quote, holy scripture contains secrets into which God does not want us to penetrate too deeply, because if we attempt to do so, increasing darkness envelops us, so that we might come to recognise in this manner both the unfathomable majesty of divine wisdom and the feebleness of the human mind. End quote. This humble language concealed the reality, because for him, God had both a contingency and mutability, 
there was thus no certain knowledge, because a conditionable, a conditional and changeable God could not have established an absolute decree and certain knowledge. Propositional truth, assertions, must give way to hypotheses, because the universe is not the total handiwork of an absolute God. Packer and Johnston stated it succinctly when they described free will in Erasmus' sense as an inherent power in man to act apart from God. Luther's answer to Erasmus, on the bondage of the will, de servo arbitrio, 1525, is clearly Luther's greatest work, and one of the greatest documents in the history of thought. Luther met Erasmus' attack on propositional truth head-on. The assertion in question, he pointed out, is the assertion of what has been delivered to us from above in the sacred scripture. Moreover, Take away assertions and you take away Christianity. As for Erasmus's preference for the skeptic's position, what Christian could talk like that? The absolute God of Scripture speaks with perspicuity in Scripture. As for Erasmus's definition of free will, Luther declared, quote, This is the kind of definition that the sophists call vicious, that is, one in which the definition fails to cover the thing defined. For I showed above that free will belongs to none but God only. You are no doubt right in assigning to man a will of some sort, but to credit him with a will that is free in the things of God is too much. For all who hear mention of free will take it to mean, in its proper sense, a will that can do and does do, God would, all that it pleases, restrained by no law and no command. For you would not call a slave who acts at the beck and call of his Lord, free. But in that case, how much less are we right to call men or angels free, for they live under the complete mastery of God, not to mention sin and death, and cannot continue by their own strength for a moment. End quote. The issue was God or man. Does man have an autonomy from God to any degree, or is man totally God's creature and entirely under God's government? When Erasmus spoke of free will, he did not mean what is commonly understood by that term, that is, that man is a responsible creature. Instead, he meant, as do all the tiresome intellectuals who trumpet free will, the autonomy of man from God, a radically different concept. Luther bluntly and discerningly cited the implications of Erasmus' position. Quote, Erasmus informs us, then, that free will is a power of the human will, which can of itself will and not will the word and work of God, by which it is to be led to these things that exceed its grasp and comprehension. If it can will and not will, it can also love and hate. If it can love and hate, it can in measure keep the law and believe the gospel. For if you can will and not will, it cannot be that you are not able to not able by that will of yours to do some part of a work, even though another should prevent your being able to complete it. Now, since death, the cross, and all the evils of the world are numbered among the works of God that lead to salvation, the human will will thus be able to will its own death and perdition. Yes, it can will all things when it can will the contents of the word and work of God. What can be anywhere below, above, within, or without the word and work of God except God himself? But what is here left to grace and the Holy Ghost? This is plainly to ascribe divinity to free will. For to will the law and the gospel is not to will sin, and to will death is possible to divine power alone, as Paul says in more places than one which means that nobody since the Pelagians has written of free will more correctly than Erasmus. For I have said above that free will is a divine term and signifies a divine power. But no one to date, except the Pelagians, has ever assigned to it much power. The sophists, whatever their views, certainly do not say anything like this. Why, Erasmus far outdoes the very Pelagians, for well, they ascribe this divinity to the whole of free will, while Erasmus ascribes it to half only. The Pelagians posit two parts of free will, a power of discernment and a power of choice, attributing the one to the reason and the other to the will, and the sophists do the same. 
but Erasmus sets aside the power of discernment and exalts the power of choice alone. Thus he makes a lame, half-free will into a god. What do you think he would have done had he set out to describe the whole of free will? End quote. To all practical intent, the god of Erasmus's diatribe was simply another name for that idol, chance under whose sway all things happen at random. Luther pointed out that the divine freedom implies human necessity. The primacy of determination is absolutely and wholly God's. Quote, Yet God does not work in us without us, for he created and preserves us for this very purpose, that he might work in us and we might cooperate with him, whether that occurs outside his kingdom by his general omnipotence or within his kingdom by the special power of his spirit. End quote. Section 3. Luther and the One and the Many. Now, let us analyse the implications of this for the problem of the one and the many. The determination of eternity by time, as dramatically evidenced by Tetzel, had reduced the triune God to a position of subordination, and even to no more than a limiting concept. By restoring the priority of God, Luther again both restored the determination of time and history to God, and placed the ultimacy of the one and the many in the triune God. With respect to the doctrine of the sacraments, Luther endangered his position by retaining the confusion and intermingling of the divine and the human in the sacrament of the Lord's table. After the Roman Catholic pattern, Ephesus and Chalcedon had barred the door to the confusion of the divine and the human, but Luther retained the Catholic doctrine to a large degree. The doctrine of the real presence is distinct from and does not require either transubstantiation or consubstantiation. Luther, whose reasoning against his opponents was usually so sharp and telling, at this point regularly fell back on dogmatic denunciations and an appeal to experience. Quote, they imagine that they contribute a great piece of wisdom when they submit the learning of their nursery and declare that water is not fire. But if they ever experienced the power and effect of baptism, of the sacrament, or of the oral word, they would indeed keep their mouths shut. End quote. There was an element of the doctrine of economic appropriation, as formulated at Ephesus, present in Luther's doctrine of the Lord's Table, but even more, as Brilioth notes in his favourable account, Luther, in his view of the sacrament, was treating the sacrament as a symbol of the Incarnation. This is precisely Luther's error. The sacrament is not a symbol of the Incarnation, but it is a sign of the Atonement. To render it a symbol of the Incarnation is radically to alter its meaning in the life of man, and also to alter the doctrine of Incarnation. The failure of Lutheranism to develop the implications of Luther's position for the doctrine of the One and the Many rests not only with Lutheran scholars, but also with Luther himself. If the sacrament setting forth the atonement is a symbol of the incarnation, then incarnation itself is an act of atonement and a dangerous door is opened wide, leading to mysticism, pietism and humanism. Section 4. Calvin. The work of Reformation begun by Luther was carried forward by John Calvin. The two men were fully agreed on essentials, and both insisted on the sovereignty of God and his absolute predestination in all things. Calvin's work was in Geneva, a city which turned to the Reformers, not out of any desire for the Reformation, but simply because the old order had collapsed and architects were needed to restore and rebuild, rebuild social order. Because social order was seen as essentially religious, it was religious leadership which Geneva sought. Geneva, an important trade centre, faced moral and social anarchy. But Geneva, even at Calvin's death, was not, on the whole, converted to the new faith, or to any faith. Cadier was right in stating that the masses had not been won over. The doctrines of the Libertines were closer to the tastes of Geneva, but such doctrines the practical people also saw as leading to anarchy. The Libertines, who were inclined towards pantheism and atheism, were also communists. They taught a community of goods and of women. 
the whole of Europe was honeycombed with secret and semi-secret fraternities or societies dedicated to spreading skepticism and enlightenment, and Geneva had a generous share of such uh, causes. Central to Calvin's strength and the vigour of his position was his doctrine of the Trinity. Warfield listed three theologians as, great, as the great orthodox theologians of this doctrine, Tertullian, Augustine and Calvin. Calvin came to the subject with a firm faith in the infallibility of scripture and the divine sovereignty. With reference to God, Calvin wrote, quote, But he also designates himself by another peculiar character, by which he may be yet more clearly distinguished. For while he declares himself to be but one, he proposes himself to be distinctly considered in three persons, without apprehending which we have only a bare and empty name of God floating in our brains without any idea of the true God. End quote. <clears throat> there is no God but the God of Scripture, the triune God, and any and all Unitarian, Arian, or subordinationist views express no faith but, quote, only a bare and empty name of God floating in our brains without any idea of the true God, end quote. To deny the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity is to fall into at least subordinationism as Arminianism did, and to entertain subordinationism is to deny God's sovereignty, as every subordinationist faith, including Arminianism, has done. Theism without orthodox Trinitarianism quickly becomes no more than a limiting concept. Calvin saw the thrust of subordinationism. It was covert atheism. For anyone to deny God the Father and to reject God the Son and God the Holy Spirit was to stand openly condemned as a heretic and an atheist. But by demoting Christ, the determination of history could be transferred from eternity to time. The man Jesus was confused in the union with God the Son, and humanity mingled with deity, and this union then lowered towards earth. Such men as profess this doctrine of Christ, quote, since they cannot openly rob him of his divinity, secretly steal from him his eternity, end quote. This is one of Calvin's most perceptive sentences. He was aware of the nature of subordinationism in all its history from the early church to this day. God is beyond time and also beyond the mind of man. Quote, how can the human mind, by its own efforts, penetrate into an examination of the essence of God when it is totally ignorant of its own? Wherefore let us freely leave to God the knowledge of himself. For he alone, as Hilary says, is a competent witness for himself, being only known by himself. End quote. Man does not discover and know God. God reveals himself to man. This revelation is true and propositional knowledge. But it is not exhaustive knowledge, nor can man have such a knowledge of God. The philosophy of Servetus thus, while formally retaining God, in actuality replaced God with man and all creation. Quote, but the most execrable blasphemy of all is his, Servetus's, promiscuous confusion of the Son of God and the Spirit with all the creatures. For he asserts that in the divine essence there are parts and divisions, every portion of which is God, and especially that the souls of the faithful are co-eternal and consubstantial with God. Though in another place he assigns substantial deity not only to the human soul, but to all created things. End quote. The bare and empty name of God floating in our brains without any idea of the true God attaches itself to man and to creation. The name of God without the biblical doctrine of the Trinity is no God at all, but rather another name for man and his world. The true God, said Calvin, is distinguished from all fictitious ones by the creation of the world. By his creation of all things out of nothing, God is Lord and sovereign over all. In Jesus Christ, there is a true union of God and man without confusion. In explaining that union, Calvin echoed the doctrine of economic appropriation of the Council of Ephesus. The error of Eutyches, the absorption of Christ's humanity into his divinity, had become the Lutheran error 
in their doctrine of the Lord's table. The doctrine of the real presence had been confused with the doctrine of unity and union with unity. Quote, there are two words commonly used, union, unio, and unity, unitas. The first is applied to the two natures, and the second to the person alone. To assert the unity of the flesh and of the divinity, those would be ashamed to do, if I am not deceived, who yet inconsiderably adopt this absurdity. For, except the flesh differs and is distinct in its own particular properties, peculiar properties from the divine nature, they are, by blending together, become one. End quote. The Lutheran doctrine of ubiquity and communion of properties confused the two natures. It read union as unity, and it fell into ancient and deadly heresies. Quote, I speak not of the Romanists, whose doctrine is more to tolerable, or at least more modest, but some are so carried away with the heart of contention as to affirm that, on account of the union of the two natures in Christ, wherever his divinity is, his flesh, which cannot be separated from it, is there also, as if that union had mingled the two natures so as to form some intermediate kind of being, which is neither God nor man. This notion was maintained by Eutyches, and since his time by Servetus. But it is clearly ascertained from the scriptures that in the one person of Christ the two natures are united in such a manner that each retains its peculiar properties undiminished. That Eucrates was justly condemned as a heretic, our adversaries will not deny. It is surprising that they overtook the cause of his condemnation, which was that by taking away the difference between the two natures and insisting on the unity of the person, he made the divinity human and defied the humanity. What absurdity, therefore, is it to mingle heaven and earth together? It is a distinction common in the schools, and which I am not ashamed to repeat, that though Christ is everywhere entire, yet all that is in him is not everywhere. And I sincerely wish that the schoolmen themselves had duly considered the meaning of this observation. For then we would never have heard of their stupid notion of the corporal presence of Christ in the sacrament. Therefore, our mediator, as he is everywhere, as he is everywhere, is always near to his people, and in the sacred supper exhibits himself present in a peculiar manner, yet not with all that belongs to him, because, as we have stated, his body has been received into heaven and remains there till he shall come to judgment. End quote. All the gains of the Reformation could be lost, Calvin saw, in this mingling of heaven and earth together. The confusion of man and God would restore determination and sovereignty to man. Man, as a part of the union with God, by virtue of man's union with Christ, could thereby govern God. Worldly sovereignties, divine monarchies, could then again rule the earth as little gods. The Church of the Incarnation would be a church governing eternity as well as time. It would be a church with authority of a godlike nature. The confusion of the natures in the Roman Church had given the Pope authority over heaven. Quote, Who can now wonder that the Pope claims primacy over every description of mortals, since he here makes himself the president of angels also? End quote. Christ in his incarnation was still as God the Son reigning in heaven. For Calvin, God was not exhausted in the Incarnation. That is, God the Son was truly incarnate in the flesh, but he was not exhaustively incarnated. Quote, Nor do we, as they pretend, imagine two kinds of seed in Adam. Notwithstanding, Christ was free from all cont contagion. For the generation of man is not naturally and originally impure and corrupt, but only accidentally so, in consequence of the fall. Therefore, we need not wonder that Christ, who was to restore our integrity, was exempted from the general corruption. But what they urge on us as an absurdity, that if the word of God was clothed, clothed with flesh, it was therefore confined within the narrow prison of an earthly body, is mere impudence, because although the infinite essence of the word is united in one person with the nature of man, Yet we have no idea of its incarnation or, or conf incarceration or confinement.
For the Son of God miraculously descended from heaven, yet in such a manner that he never left heaven. He chose to be miraculously conceived in the womb of, a vir of the Virgin, to live on the earth, and to be suspended on the cross, and yet he never ceased to fill the universe in the same manner as from the beginning. End quote. It is for this reason, among others, that modernism and neo-orthodoxy are so hostile to Calvin. His doctrine of Christ cannot be absorbed into their systems. Neo-orthodoxy exhausts God in his revelation, so that God is humanized and time triumphs over eternity. But not so in Calvin's doctrine. He spoke sharply against this alchemy as cursed blasphemies. Quote, here again, the devil tries to stir up the coals of strife by perverting or disguising the doctrine which St. Paul teaches us. For there have been heretics who have endeavoured to maintain that the majesty and Godhead of Jesus Christ, his heavenly essence, was forthwith changed into flesh and manhood. Thus did some say, with many other cursed blasphemies, that Jesus Christ was made man. What will follow hereupon? God must forego his nature, and his spiritual essence must be turned into flesh. They go on further and say Jesus Christ is no more man, but his flesh has become God. These are marvellous alchemists, to make so many new natures of Jesus Christ. Thus the devil raised up such dreamers in old times to trouble the faith of the church, who are now renewed in our time. End quote. Thus Calvin by his doctrine of the Incarnation and of the Trinity, retains the integrity of the doctrine of God. The one and the many are maintained in their equal ultimacy in the triune God, and man is barred from participation in that ultimacy. Calvin's doctrine of the Lord's Table strictly maintained the real presence while denying either confusion or any absorption or assimilation of man into the Godhead. The sacrament sets forth the membership and participation of the believer in the new and redeemed humanity of Jesus Christ, the last Adam. In his comment on John 6.51, The bread which I shall give is my flesh. Calvin delighted in the fact that through Christ, flesh, humanity, which once conveyed death to us, now conveys life. It is not the humanity or flesh of Christ which in itself or intrinsically, conveys life to us, but it is the humanity of Christ, which, by union with the divinity of Christ, makes us partakers of the divine nature, its righteousness, which is life itself. Quote, but an objection is brought that the flesh of Christ cannot give life because it was liable to death, and because even now it is not immoral in itself. And next, that it does not all belong to the nature of flesh to quicken souls. I reply, though, this, I reply, though this power comes from another source than from the flesh, still this is no reason why the designation may not accurately apply to it. For as the eternal word of God is the fountain of life, John 1, 4, so his flesh, as a channel, conveys to us that life which dwells intrinsically, as we say, in his divinity. And in this sense, it is called life-giving, because it conveys to us that life which borrows from another quarter. This will not be difficult to understand if we consider what is the cause of life, namely righteousness. And, through righteous, and though righteousness flows from God alone, still we shall not attain the full manifestation of it anywhere else than in the flesh of Christ, for in it was accomplished the redemption of man. In it, a sacrifice was offered to atone for sins, and obedience yielded to God, to reconcile him to us. It was also fitted with a, filled with the sanctification of the Spirit, and at length, having vanquished death, it was received into the heavenly glory. It follows, therefore, that all the parts of life have been placed in it, that no man may have reason to complain that he is deprived of life as if it were placed in a concealment or at a distance. End quote. Calvin's doctrine of the sacrament thus barred a metaphysical doctrine of salvation. Man was not made God by his redemption, he was renewed as a man. Salvation is an ethical, not a metaphysical fact. 
and the sacrament celebrates an ethical, not a met metaphysical, change. A change of substance in the communion elements means a change of substance in man. A metaphysical concept of salvation is attested in such a doctrine. This Calvin firmly denied. The whole Christ is, in a sense, given in the sacrament, but it is not in any sense other than an ethical one. Jesus Christ communicates to us by his atoning work, celebrated in the sacrament, the righteousness of God unto salvation. The Lutheran doctrine, as Calvin noted, calls for participation in all of Christ, his deity, as well as his humanity. <clears throat> Quote, we say that though Christ is in heaven, yet through the hidden and incomprehensible power of the Spirit, this favour comes to us, that his flesh becomes life to us, so that we become flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones. Ephesians verse 30. By them, on the contrary, it is maintained that except Christ comes down on earth, there is no participation. That they may, however, get rid of the absurdity of a local presence, it has been found necessary to fabricate the strange notion of ubiquity, which, if we think it not possible to reconcile the principles of faith, we must beg them at least to pardon our ignorance. Here we follow not our own understanding, but according to the knowledge given us from above. We cannot comprehend that it is all agreeable to Scripture to say that the body of Christ is everywhere. Both Christ himself and his apostles clearly show that the immensity of God does not belong to the flesh. A personal union is what they teach. And no one, except Eutyches, has hitherto taught that the two natures became so blended that when Christ became man, the attributes of deity were communicated to his human nature. End quote. The humanity of Christ, being made ubiquitous, shares the attributes of his divinity and is everywhere. And the believer in the sacrament literally partakes of a body that is mingled with divinity. From ethics to metaphysics, from biblical salvation to deification, such is the direction of this doctrine. But for Calvin, from first to last, salvation is an ethical act, and the purpose of the sacrament is to have part and portion in all the graces which he purchased for us by his death. Quote, Moreover, if the reason for communicating with Jesus Christ is to have part and portion in all the graces which he purchased for us by his death, the thing requisite must not only to be must be not only to be partakers of his spirit, but also to participate in his humanity, in which he rendered all obedience to God the Father, in order to satisfy our debts, although, properly speaking, the one cannot be without the other. For when he gives himself to us, it is in order that we may possess him entirely. End quote. Some, however, seeking a metaphysical doctrine of salvation, misread the words of Peter, 2 Peter 1 verse 4, concerning being made partakers of the divine nature in a metaphysical rather than an ethical sense. Calvin condemned this delirious dream. In commenting on the phrase, Calvin wrote, quote, But the word nature is not here essence, but quality. The Manichaeans formerly dreamt that we are a part of God, and that after having run the race of life, we shall at length revert to our original. There are also at this day fanatics who imagine that we thus pass over into the nature of God, so that his swallows up our nature. Thus they explain what Paul says, that God will be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15.28 And in the same sense they take this passage. But such a delirium as this never entered the minds of the holy apostles. They only intended to say that when divested of all the vices of the flesh... We shall be partakers of divine and blessed immortality and glory, so as to be, as it were, one with God as far as our capacities will allow. This doctrine was not altogether unknown to Plato, who everywhere defines the chief good of man to be an entire conformity to God. But as he was involved in the mists of errors, he afterwards glided off into his own inventions. But we, disregarding empty speculations, ought to be satisfied with this one thing, that the image of God in holiness and righteousness is restored to us for this end. 
that we may at length be partakers of eternal life and glory as far as it will be necessary for our complete felicity. End quote. <clears throat> Calvin underscored the sovereignty of God in his great writings on predestination. The doctrine of predestination is in particular associated with the name of Calvin, although it was Luther, in reply to Erasmus, who gave the first and great Reformation statement of the doctrine. The unity of the Godhead, the reality of the three persons, and the absolute God, as the absolute and only first cause of all things, was strongly affirmed by Calvin. To allow any liberty with respect to first causes to the creature is to erect a God out of the creature and to make, like the Manichees, two ruling principles. Either God's will is the absolute and only first cause, or else two or more ruling principles or gods are admitted into one's faith. Men seek to void God's sovereignty, Calvin pointed out, in the name of asserting their reason and their justice in judgment over God. Quote, Yet on this hinge turns the whole question. Is there no justice of God but that which is conceived by us? End quote. In reply to Picius, Calvin wrote, quote, Marvellous indeed is the madness of man, who would more audaciously set himself above God than stand on equal ground with any pagan judge. It is, intoler it is intolerable to you and hateful that the power and works of God should exceed the capacity of your own mind, and yet you will grant to an equal the enjoyment of his own mind and judgment? End quote. Thus, with respect to the doctrines of God and man, Calvin blocked the door to any temporal power or to any temporal one as well as a temporal many, seizing ultimacy and sovereignty. The weak link in Calvin came elsewhere. Section 5. Calvin on Law and Love We have seen how Calvin at times underrated the law, as did Luther also, and that Calvin expressed a preference for the common law of nations as against the polity of Moses. With this, without realising it, Calvin reopened the door to natural law, and also to common grace, a concept he would not have recognised. The idea of common grace has become, however, the chief doctrine of modern neo-Calvinism, and the state is grounded on common grace as its sphere. Moreover, Calvin saw man as the subject of two kinds of government. An inner one, relating to eternal life, is the province of the church. The other is civil government which relates to civil justice and the regulation of the external conduct. For this outer world, virtually all the world, Calvin rejected biblical law. The world was thus in effect sundered from God, and at this point given its own sovereignty and independence. But Calvin did not apply these ideas. Instead, he surpassed Luther and insisted that the state must enforce both tables of the law, that the state, in short, must be Christian, not natural or neutral, a possibility he denied. Civil government, he held, must enforce God's law. For Calvin, the rule of life which God has given us is his law. At the same time, Calvin strongly emphasised the duty of love. Men are so used to reviling Calvin for his belief in predestination that they fail to notice the very heavy emphasis he placed on loving and doing good to all men. Thus, Calvin wrote, Whoever, therefore, is presented to you that needs your kind offices, you have no reason to refuse him your assistance. Say that he is a stranger, yet the Lord has impressed on him a character which ought to be familiar to you, for which reason he forbids you to despise your own flesh. Isaiah 18.3 Say that he is contemptible and worthless, but the Lord shows him to be one whom he has deigned to grace with his own image. Say that you are obliged to him for no services, but God has made him, as it were, his substitute, to whom you acknowledge yourself to be under obligations for numerous and important benefits. Say that he is unworthy of your making the smallest exertion 
on his account, but the image of God, by which he is recommended to you, deserves your surrender of yourself and all that you possess. If he not only has deserved no favour, but on the contrary has provoked you with injuries and insults, even this is no just reason why you should cease to embrace him with your affection, and to perform to him the offices of love. He had deserved, you will say, very different treatment from me. But what, had, but what has the Lord deserved, who, when he commands you to forgive all men, to forgive men all their offences against you, certainly intends that they should be charged to himself? This is the only way of attaining that which, not only, that which is not only difficult, but utterly repugnant to the nature of man, to love them who hate us. Matthew 5.44 to requite injuries with kindnesses, and to return blessings for curses. Luke 7, 3 and 4 We should remember that we must not reflect on the wickedness of men, but contemplate the divine image in them, which, concealing and obliterating their faults, by its beauty and dignity, allures us to embrace them in the arms of our love. End quote. This is virtually a doctrine of unconditional love. It has a vein of antinomianism in it. It is close to the position of modern liberals who believe in salvation by love. This undue and disproportionate emphasis on love appears at times in Calvin. Combined with the inconsistent attitude on law, it gave ground for the development of a liberalism out of Calvin. On the one hand, some English and American Puritans used one element of Calvinism to, to develop a concept of society grounded on God's sovereignty and biblical law. On the other hand, however hopelessly in er error Fairchild's theology is, his point is well taken that Calvinism is, in England also led to sentimentalism and a naturalistic humanism. Section 6. Richard Hooker and England had little to counteract this trend, since the semi-official position of the Church of England came to be Erastian, Armenian and heretical. Richard Hooker, 1553-1600, was clearly subordinationist and Arian in his Christology. Hooker wrote, quote, Seeing therefore the Father alone is originally that deity which Christ originally is not, for Christ is God by being of God, light by issuing out of light, it followeth hereupon that whatsoever Christ hath common unto him with his heavenly Father, the same of necessity must be given him, but naturally and eternally given, not bestowed by way of benevolence and favour, as the other gifts both are. And therefore, where the fathers give it out for a rule, that whatsoever Christ said in Scripture to have received, the same we ought to apply only to the manhood of Christ. Their assertion is true of all things which Christ hath received by grace, but to that which he hath received of the Father by eternal nativity or birth, it reacheth not. End quote. However much Hooker tried to claim the church fathers for his position, it was clearly heresy. Hooker, while trying to emphasize grace as the ground of man's deification in Christ, still deified Chalcedon to insist, still defied Chalcedon to insist that in Christ man is really made God. The union, therefore, of the flesh with deity is to that flesh a gift of principal grace and favour. For by virtue of this grace, man is really made God. A creature is exalted above the dignity of all creatures, and hath all creatures also under it. End quote. When challenged by a Calvinist to prove how his position differed from that of Arius, Hooker's answer was, quote, the Godhead of the Father and of the Son is no way denied, but granted to be the same. The only thing that, the only thing denied is that the person of the Son hath deity, or Godhead, in such sort as the Father hath it. End quote. Having introduced man into the Godhead, Hooker plainly made God's associate in the government Hooker plainly made man God's associate in the government of all things. Thus, the British monarchy now had, indeed, a divine right of amazing dimensions. As Hooker stated the doctrine of man's divinity, quote, Finally, since God hath defied our, deified our nature, 
though not by turning it into himself, yet by making it his own inseparable habitation, we cannot now conceive how God should, without man, either exercise divine power or receive the glory of divine praise. For man is in both an associate of deity. End quote. It is not surprising that the British monarchs loved their Mr. Hooker. Hooker introduced man into the Godhead, subordinated British subjects firmly to an absolute monarch on religious grounds, and saw the monarchy and the English church state as a divine order. The monarch, as head of the church as well as head of the state, had a vast power over the lives of his subjects. Had not the Puritan Commonwealth altered the course of the monarchy, England's lot would have been a fearful one. The divine one and many had been denied in favour of a divine human order. Hooker, no less than Loyola, represented a form of counter-reformation. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows, or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His Kingdom.